Hey, look, folks. Thank you for being a little bit early. Let me start getting my, uh, how you say, audio checks, video checks in. Can everyone hear my audio? Okay. Want to raise their hand? Okay, cool. I see a raised hand as well. We'll have uh, the questions at the end. And there's a Q&A box as well. So if you could um, if you could put your questions in the Q&A box, that'll make it easier for me to get to them at the end as well. So you can see me on video. And if I share my screen, no, you know what? I don't want to share my screen. I want to do OBS Studio. And how does that look? We'll be getting started in just a minute. Let me just make sure the audio visual is working for everybody. So if I switch to webcam and screen, then you're seeing what you should be seeing. Perfect. Okay, I understand that it's a little bit blurry. Yeah, it does look decently blurry. And uh, there will be recordings and slides, but I'll basically be explaining everything that's on here. Um, so if you can't read something, that's all right. You'll get the slides, and I'll be I'll be explaining whatever's on the screen, anyways. Okay. Okay. Hello, folks. Welcome to the training. Yeah, it's twelve o'clock, so we can start. Right about now. Um, we're gonna be having the same format as yesterday, uh, where you can see me, you can see the screen as well. And uh, I'll be throwing up polls as well. So if you could participate in the polls. Um, so the questions about the recordings, uh, you should be getting an email with the recordings. You should have already gotten one actually, um, but I will put in the chat right now, a link to the, oh, that is not, that is a link to my Google Drive. Well, it doesn't matter if you go there because that's just going to send you to your own Google Drive. Here is a link to everyone. That That's the recordings right there, okay? Um, you'll be getting an email with that link as well, okay? So I'm going to start off with the poll to see if people have been practicing, okay? And if you, you have or haven't, we're going to start off with the practice because the way this is going to go is I'm going to take you into the breathing practice because the point of this is for you to get results, right? This is, this is for you to improve the health and for you to feel the breathing physically and see what's happening inside of you. And then I will take you through the theory. And while you listen to the theory and while you think about the theory, continue breathing. And we'll have some breathing exercises throughout the, throughout the practice, okay? So let me let me ask if people to practice first. It, it is really important to practice because this takes, I would say, a couple of solid hours initially of awareness and meditation. If you've tried to do meditation before, it's it's sort of like that where you don't quite get it until you get it. And then once you get it, you can drop into meditative states anytime and meditation gets deeper and deeper. Um, anybody can feel the breathing. So if you're starting new today, we're going to take you right through the start of the breathing as well. And you'll be able to feel it through your body at the very least. And through practice, you're going to be able to feel it all the way through your skull and start getting adjustments, which is our goal. If you could feel the breathing and you could feel it into your head, today is the day you should start feeling flexing of your skull bones and movement in the skull bones and possibly getting adjustments. Um, so about 65% of people did practice, 35% did not. And the people that did practice, more than half of them could feel the intensification. I wanna say more than half, it's about 70 to 80% because 35% didn't practice. So if you, as you practice this, the feelings 
will continue to intensify. Okay, so let's start off with a practice. You have to get yourself into a calm state because there's a lot of sensory information going on inside of you. Emotional information, there's visual information, there's thoughts. We've determined yesterday, according to Hopkins Institute, that the fascia which runs through your body is essentially as sensitive as your skin. And you can see on the pictures here that this truly runs through your entire body. The head's not in that picture, but it runs through the head as well. You have the level of sensitivity that you have on your skin all through your body. You're just unconscious of it until it hurts, usually. Sometimes you can feel pain inside your body, and then you notice that you can feel the fascia. Until it hurts, you don't notice it. And... When the structure, when the fascia starts collapsing in its structure, you can visually see that it's collapsing. You'll start getting pains and aches and all the issues that come with that. But you only notice that when things start going wrong. So what we're going to do with the breathing is relax you into a state that all of the sensory information that's currently going through your fascia, you can start to feel it. And that's how we're going to start correcting it and pulling things into place. Most important thing is that you relax into calmness right now. So this is not an exercise other than an exercise in awareness. This is what your body is doing with every single breath. The fascia runs through your entire body. It tugs and pulls on every part of the body. And whenever any part of your body moves, the fascial network around the body feels it. We're going to tune into that with the breathing. Okay? So what I want you to do is notice the expansion in your chest on every inhale. The bones that are moving, the lungs that are moving, the pleura, and the, the muscles in the chest, those are all enmeshed and surrounded by fascia. Okay, so you're feeling the fascia across your whole chest. You breathe in, it widens. Feel where it widens. And you have a good feeling for your chest. With your palms facing upwards, you put your palms down on your knees. So you have your hands resting on your knees and your palms facing upwards. I want you to notice where the breath goes, where the expansion of the breath goes. And in the same way, I want you to flip the hands over so that their palms down and then feel that the breath goes down more into your belly this way or into the diaphragm area. So when your palms are down, you're expanding more in the belly. And when you flip your palms up, it's more your upper chest and your chest that expands. And when you clench your fists with some anger, think of something that makes you angry, clench your fists, and you're gonna feel that your breathing across your chest is restricted. Keep them clenched. Take a few solid breaths. And then for the next time that you breathe in, relax your hands and see how much deeper that breath is. For many people, they, they won't notice that their hands, the position of their hands and the clenching of their hands, the tightness has such an effect on their breathing. The reason that it has such an effect is because your entire body is one structure of fascia, okay? Every bit tugs on every other bit. 
And that's what we were going to use to get adjustment in the cranium and fixing of like spinal issues and all of the, the issues that happen in the body. I want you to continue practicing that. Get deeper and deeper into that feeling that in fact, the breath goes through the whole body. Clenching your fists makes it harder for the breathing to expand into the chest. If you clench your pelvic floor and your feet, you'll find the breathing even more difficult. And then when you unclench, you can take a full breath again. When you get angry, the typical response is to clench your fist. When you get scared, the response is to like tighten your pelvic floor. These are the sort of traumas that you, if you don't fully process them, you build them up over the years. And these could have been traumas from before you remember. And they build up over the years. And before you know it, you're not able to take a proper breath. You're, you're clenched in your breathing. And when you do that, the system of fascia, this tensegrity structure, which gives the shape of your body, that collapses. Yeah. This is what it looks like on an operating table. And that's what you can kind of visualize it at. It's a web, it's a network. That's the shape of your body and it all breathes. If it gets tight in any one spot, it starts pulling into that area. You start getting tugs into areas you shouldn't. The structure starts collapsing. And you notice that when it shows up as symptoms or as pain. A lot of you already, I can take a guess that you're, you, when you feel the tightness in the front of the body, you can probably already feel that there's emotions associated with that as well. And people are noticing that, you know, one side doesn't expand as much as the other. There you go. That's where asymmetries come from. That, that's you, you probably, you can feel that all the way up your body, up the side of your face. For people, it's going to depend on your specific case. But for a lot of people, if, if your right side's not expanding as much, you can feel that into your face and your head, and you can see where you're asymmetric. So keep feeling that breathing. We're going to get deeper into that, flex the skull bones, and get adjustments. While I go over a brief, deeper dive into the anatomy that we did yesterday, why does this make scientific sense? Because we, as a practice, we really want to keep to what can be proven. Okay, that's really important to myself and um, to the, the idea as a whole. What becomes the muscles of your jaw and your neck and the structures of your jaw and your neck and also the structures that are further down your body, those start off as pharyngeal arches okay if you can see the first picture this is essentially the embryo of what most animals looks like and in a fish these arches become the gills if you've ever seen the gills of a fish those are breathing mechanisms as you evolve through your embryology and through the evolution in species these breathing mechanisms started to serve other functions. But the nerve connections are all still there. The, the main function of breathing that exists throughout this whole structure has existed since we we're in that early form. So embryologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, that is why it makes sense that you feel the breathing all the way through these areas of the body. Because this is what we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna focus on the neck muscles, okay? getting their feeling of breathing because this is where your gills used to be now it's your jaw and your neck but it's the same structure a fish starts out the same way that you do and this part of the fish becomes the gills and you it becomes the jaws and the neck and the ribs and all that okay so we're going to get a feeling for how this breathes this up here So we'll end that first bowl. For how all of this reads. 
is where we're going to get a feeling for and then feel how that tugs the skull bones. Now you can get adjustments like that. Why this makes further sense is when you look at the way that the skull develops, um, it mostly develops in its lower third between infanthood and adulthood. And it develops because of all of these muscle connections and that breathing muscles, they constantly tug down on the skull and pull it into its proper shape. I want you to notice something and I'll see if I can even zoom in. Can I? I'll just make the image bigger. It, that on a baby, there's this thing called the mastoid process, okay? So I want you to feel right now behind your ear. You feel right here behind your ear, behind the earlobe. Take your finger and you can feel the bottom part of your skull. Okay? That's your temporal bone. In a baby, that bone is not really developed at all. What happens is when a muscle repeatedly tugs on bone, new bone deposits. And you can see where my mouse is, the evolution of the tugging on the mastoid process. Essentially, as a baby, you got pretty much none. And then over as into adulthood, as your lower jaw, lower skull, all this develops, it's because of the repeated tugging motion of these muscles of the neck. This is, in our theory, how proper craniofacial development should happen. And if you lack this tugging force, you essentially get, what do jaws look like when they're undergrown? They look like the baby jaw on the left, right? It's back. It's not fully developed forward. It's not as robust. It looks neon, neotonous. Neotonous? It looks like a baby one because it, it, that's essentially what it is. It's a jaw and lower facial structure that hasn't fully grown forward. An under eye area, cheekbones that have not fully been grown forward. They didn't get fully tugged forward. So we are going to focus deeply in on the temporal bone today. And the breathing muscles that connect up into it. Let me run a poll asking why it is called the temporal bone, if you, if you heard of it. I think you can also read, uh, this is legible. So if you want to have a read of what's on the right side, um, our theories are not in a vacuum. Um, we're pulling from a lot of different fields of science and understanding. So like Stills and Sutherland are, you know, founders of cranial osteopathy and cranial sacral therapy. And so Sutherland was more uh, cranial sacral therapy and his understanding um, largely came from, his aha moment largely came from looking at the temporal bone. And he saw, and I'll show you this on the video slow, shortly, that, wow, the temporal bone seems to be built so that it can slide and move. And that's exactly how it is built. Yeah, Sutherland created cranial osteopathy. Thank you for that. Um, so the note, the noticing there was that the bones of the skull are articulated and created in such a way that they seem to glide against each other and move so that they can move in a rhythm. This rhythm, we're going to explore the fact that this rhythm is driven by the respiration, normal respiration. Those of you know who CST. Uh, and those theories, primary respiration and those topics are things that we get deep into further along. But to get the whole motion restarted, you can just you can use the normal respiration of the body and the fascial connections in the body because of the way that the muscles attach to these bones. They attach in such a way that they perfectly move the bones the way they should move. So let us have a look at that on video. This is typically what the motion should like. It's like, a, it's a, should look like. It's a gentle flexing and movement. Yeah. 
And the temporal bone is really important for this because you can see how much it overlaps the other bones. And it's, it's structure is such that it's meant to glide forward. And we're gonna see that the muscular attachments of the neck on the inhale, pull it to glide forward every single breath. And when you notice that it's supposed to glide forward and that you can pull it forward, you see how much that overlaps? Look how much the temporal bone, that's the side of your head, overlaps the top. And it's supposed to do this motion, this flexing motion on every inhale. And we're going to explore today that the, the muscles of the side of your neck, those link up into the temporal bone in such a way that when you breathe in, you're causing that motion to happen and then flexing throughout your entire skull. So continue with the breathing practice, feeling the fascia through your whole body and noticing more and more the sides of your neck involved in breathing and the sides of your head. Now, the response to the pole of why is it called the temporal bone? Um, pretty much everyone got it right to some degree. Um, so it is the temple region of the skull, that area is called the temple. And you know they say it shows the passage of time because your temples usually have white hair first. And a lot of you got the right answer right away that it keeps the breathing tempo. And no one, no one can really identify who called it the temporal bone both first. You know, these are more Latin names and older. Why is it called the temporal bone? If we can go a bit esoteric with the theory, I think it's because it really is the tempo of the body. This bone is so connected with the breathing, as you can see here. This is your temporal bone where my mouse is. Okay. This right here is the temporal bone. And this is what gets tugged very, very strongly on the inhale. A little bit more theory before we practice more. Inside of your skull, you have the meninges. This is very important for the craniosacral therapist, for the osteopaths as well, that the tentorium cerebelli and the fox rib form your meninges, and the meninges also coat the entire inside of the skull. And this, this pattern of tight fascia, we can call it, we're speaking a little bit loosely, essentially goes all the way down the spine up until your sacral area. Sutherland called the area where the tentorium cerebelli and the fox ribby meet, he called that, that was Sutherland's fulcrum. Well, that was something like a name that was sort of given after, but like it was a store location for finding the tension throughout the body. Um, so for those of you who know about that, that's going to be important going forward. When we can breathe with the muscles of the side of the neck and start pulling the cranial bones into motion, as we found out yesterday, on every single inhale, the craniosacral fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, you can call it whichever you like, the pressure in the head increases on every single inhale, studies show. So when you breathe in, there's a natural expansion force inside the head, pushing your your skull to expand like a balloon. Inside of the skull, resisting this are these meninges, this tight, tight fascia, fascial structures that are not going to allow expansion unless they loosen up. Okay, so when we're talking about expanding the body structure and like fixing issues in your spine, fixing issues in your skull, this is why treatment methods that focus only on the outside. They, they, they start getting improvement and then they hit a wall or a block in their improvement because you can only pull so much until the internal structures, they need to start letting go to let the body expand further. Okay, so we're working on the inside and the outside with our approach.
Today, we're going to be feeling the sides of the head and the outsides of the temporal, the bones, the temporal bones, and pulling those open. And if you have a really good sense of proprioception, you can start feeling the meninges. When you have a headache, this is what you're feeling. These are the things inside your head that actually have sensory ability, the fascia inside your head. Within our theory and our practice, what you notice is that there are multiple diaphragms. You have your main breathing diaphragm, and this is a the PRI Institute on the left who has also realized that this tentorium in your head, this area, this is also a diaphragm. And many, many practices over the years have realized that there are many diaphragms. In the full depth of our training in whole body breathing, we, we do get into every single diaphragm. But for the purposes of learning, if you're just starting, just focus on your, your main breathing diaphragm, your head diaphragm, and then your pelvic diaphragm. Okay. Today, we're going to be focusing on the head. The reason why it works this way is that there's an as above so below type of relationship okay so you have like the the muscles of the neck that pull open the head diaphragm and then you have the muscles of the deep core that open the main diaphragm um those muscles of the core the psoas muscle opening up the diaphragm that's something that's really understood already in um postural science in like physiotherapy in a lot of places, um, you know, anatomy trains, a lot of people already understand this. What we're really unlocking in whole body breathing is the, the head diaphragm and the chain of neck muscles that as above, so below, they open up the head diaphragm. And I don't think anyone's looked at that as far as I can tell, not to this depth, at least uh, as far as I can tell. So we will go into feeling the neck muscles. Let's, let's see who, where we are as a group, because from the questions that I got and the responses that I got, I can see that the group is really, a, there's quite a diverse group of people here. Um, it's not just the one. So let me ask what the SEM is, just to get a, get a good feel for the knowledge level. Okay, so we have an excellently high participation rate. And don't worry, I'm the only one who can see the responses. And I can't even see the names until after the whole session's over. So no one else will see if you, you guess incorrectly. So give it a guess if you're part of that uh, 43%, 40% now that have not participated yet. Okay, we're pretty good. It's, it's not a trick question. The sternocleidomastoid is what the SCM muscle is. And I'll just let me just show you that most of you got that correct. Almost everyone got that correct. Um, and if you didn't, then thank you for participating because that's what's required. Like, really, 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 that's what's required. This is a participatory process, right? I can't just explain this to you. I'm proposing this to you. I'm saying this is how I think the body works, this is how I think the breathing works. Can you try it on yourself and let me and everyone know, like, does that seem like what it is? Um, and, and we're going to work together to actually determine what's going on in the body. And we've been running a lot of people through the course, through the training, and we've had repeatable results, repeatable understandings. And that's what we're sharing here. Okay. We'll end that right there. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle is what connects, if you have a look at myself, and you can feel that real quick, if you just turn your head to the side, and you see this muscle, you see this tight thing that comes up, that is your SEM. Have a look at yourself, get a feel for it. Actually, actually put your hands on it and get a feel for where it connects. It goes down to your sternum. Like you see, the, it's the muscle that pops out. And as people correctly identified in the training that we did previously, that what is beauty? Beauty is a health indicator. 
okay? You, you will notice when you go out day to day, I want you to have a look at people who have really well-developed faces, have a look at their neck, have a look at their SCM muscle. I think a lot of you probably subconsciously or consciously understand that you find a muscle of the SCM that's really well-defined, you find that quite attractive because it, it's part of this whole breathing chain. It indicates that the person's re resilient and that they're breathing properly. So this SCM muscle right here, it connects up behind your ear and then into the back of the head. And it goes down into your chest. Okay. Muscles are fuzzy. Um, when we look at an anatomy textbook, like I'm showing you on the screen here, when we look at an anatomy textbook, they do try to simplify as much as possible because the red part, which is the muscle, turns into this white stuff, which is that, you know, the tendon and the connection points. And that just becomes fascia. That just becomes the general milieu you know, the, just the general mesh of the body. And then it, rather than looking at the body as a series of muscles, look at it as a fascial network that has muscles tugging the fascia around. That's, that's what, you know, people are getting to that sort of conclusion, that that's more what the body is. So when we look at an anatomy textbook, this one say, um, art by Giovanni, I don't own these, but the, the fascial chain reaches up into the sides of the head and then it becomes your scalp, the scalp aponeurosis. Okay. So where your, your SCM muscle, now we're going to focus on, we're going to meditate on. On the inhale, these are your accessory muscles of breathing. It's understood in sports science and in medicine and by yourself in general, that when you are sprinting, when you really need to take in a lot of oxygen, you know these neck muscles start activating. You might not notice, but uh, you know the people who study this sort of thing, for sure, they, they say these muscles are used for breathing. They're really, really used for breathing when you're breathing hard, when you really need that oxygen. What we propose is that actually all of these muscles, the entire fascial network is breathing all the time. In fact, that's part of the normal rhythm of the body. And when that's happening properly, then the body's shape and structure forms properly. Most importantly for now, what you have is a diaphragm in your head. So from the back of your head, if you reach back, if you reach around to the back of your head, you should feel a ridge. That's your suboccipital ridge. And then you have a zygomatic arch. And then you got a palate. Yeah. This is your, the diaphragm of your head. It looks much like the diaphragm, your main diaphragm, your breathing diaphragm. These things parallel each other. Good. So why we're focusing on the SCM is because it's, it's the most obvious part in this muscle chain that pulls open the head diaphragm. And the way that the temporal bone, as we've seen, the way that these things are set up, this bone is designed to pull away. It's designed to move. It overlaps in such a way that it gets tugged on. And when it gets tugged on, it has this proper flexing motion. And the muscle which tugs it, the muscle which tugs on this mastoid process and tugs on the back of the head that's most easily detectable is this, your sternocleidomastoid. That's why we start here. Okay. So what I want you to try is to relax your head forward, to just let your head relax on your neck so that your spine muscles, like, sorry, these, these neck muscles aren't doing so much work to just let it hang forward. If you have a look, logically speaking, logically speaking, when a muscle contracts, there's a tug on both sides. So when you breathe in, this is your chest, this muscle pulls your chest up. That is the motion of your rib cage on the inhale. Your rib cage lifts and rotates. 
this muscle lifts and rotates your rib cage, the sternocleidomastoid. You don't have to focus on this muscle specifically. This is, this is the best muscle to give you the example. But essentially what I want you to notice is that when you breathe in, your chest lifts and expands. And there's muscles going from your chest, from your clavicle area, up the sides of your neck, to the sides and back of your head. Those muscles are helping lift the chest and helping lift the clavicle. See if you can detect. Importantly, don't try to detect the middle of the muscle. Don't try to detect it in the middle of the neck. Find the attachment points. So up here and down here. Find those attachment points. That's where you're going to feel the tug the most. Such that every time you breathe in, you can feel the lip, the rib cage, the clavicle, all of that lifting and expanding, like we know it does. And then feel the muscles on the sides of your neck doing some of that work to lift the rib cage. If you're having trouble at all, you can add in the muscles that are your shoulders. So from your shoulders up the sides of your neck, because your shoulders are going to fall away as the rib cage lifts and expands. This is a meditation. This is a relaxed observation. We're not trying to make this happen. We're noticing whether or not it happened. Somebody had mentioned the other day that their shoulders also lifted when they breathe in because they're wearing their shoulders like earrings. So keeping your shoulders somewhat in place and relaxing them. Feel the tug from your shoulders and your neck muscles and your chest all the way up the sides of your head to the back of your head. And see if you can feel a tug behind your ears and into the back of your head. We'll add one more exercise to this just to get, to get further into it. What is the motion? If you look at the picture here, sorry. What is the motion that this muscle does for posture? If this muscle contracts, the SCM and the neck, if it contracts, it's gonna tilt your head back. Like you can see on the right picture here, when this muscle contracts, your head gets pulled back. Okay. So what we can do is relax the head forward like this. And then on the inhale, feel your head get tugged back just slightly. This might not be as exaggerated as I'm showing here, but when you breathe in, can you feel your SCM and your neck muscles tug your head back and rotate your head on every single inhale? I'll stay with you for a moment while we try to get that. Really do try to get this part started. And if you can't get it, I have another thing that you can try and notice as well, okay? Just as much as your rib cage expands, your head is getting tugged to expand along with it. There's a gentle tug behind your ears on the back of your head that pulls your head slightly back every time you breathe in. If you have trouble feeling this when you're sitting, you can try laying down so that those posture muscles kind of shut off and they can just breathe.
we're not dropping the chin down towards the chest intentionally. When you relax the sides of your neck, your head just sort of typically will drop forward. And then when you breathe in, these muscles are gonna contract. So as these muscles contract, you're gonna tilt your head back. As these muscles lift up your chest, right? like so. These muscles lift up your chest and your ribs on the inhale. And as they do so, they tug on the back of your head like that. It takes practice and it gets deeper and it gets easier. What a large part of you might feel is tingling. And as said before, when your hand goes to sleep, the nerve signals in your hand are not going to your brain and such. They're not really communicating. When your hand starts to wake up from sleep or your leg starts to wake up, what you get first is tingling. You just get a general tingling sensation in the area. And then as you become more reacquainted with the leg, then you can start feeling it again. At first, it's just a numb movement, and then you can actually use the leg properly. The feeling that you have in the back of the head in this area, it might start off as tingling. That's good. But don't just focus on the tingling. Keep deepening your awareness of it until it becomes actually you're really feeling what's going on here. We want to feel the real anatomical structures, not just some generalized feeling. We want, we want to be our own physician. I want you to be able to practice this on yourself so you can do it yourself and know exactly this is what's going on. This is where my temporal bone is. This is how things are getting pulled. Okay. I will ask you shortly how you're feeling it. Before that, I want to make sure that everyone's getting an understanding of this. So if you're feeling your SEM, continue feeling that. I, I recommend you just continue feeling that sensation. What can work for a lot of people, a good entry point to this is your jaw. Okay, So you have muscles that go from your the bottom of your jaw down to your sternum. So they go through your hyoid and you can just, you can see the muscles here and you can see them on myself, these muscles, okay? So when you breathe in and your chest lifts, these muscles also are involved in that tug. And since your jaw is hanging loose, what might be easy for you to notice is that your jaw gets pulled slightly down when you inhale. So if you can detect it in your SCMs, try detecting movement in your jaw. That your jaw will get pulled slightly down. And logically speaking, it makes sense. These muscles all connect up through the hyoid in your lower jaw. When you breathe in, these muscles help tug open the chest a little bit, and you have a corresponding pull down on your jaw. If you can feel that a lot more, focus on that. If you can feel the SEMs, just stay with the SEMs. Because what we're going to do is we're going to start getting some feeling and then we're gonna expand that awareness until you can feel this entire area moving over time. So I'm gonna ask you now how people are feeling it. You can take your time with this poll. Right on. Right on. So 
it's beautiful that most people say they can feel both. I'll have you for the purpose of this training. Let's go into the SCM. Stay with that more because that's a really big muscle, really big group. I'll show you the answers here. Um, 68% participation. If, you, if you're part of that 38, uh, 30 or so percent, it helps. It helps where we're at. But, so there's nobody that can't feel anything, which is excellent. Um, and everyone can feel something to some degree. If you can feel in both, that's amazing because we're going to get deeper into both uh, tomorrow's class. Okay. Because really, this is a huge muscle chain. We're just tuning into these two muscles to feel things. And then once you get it, start getting a feel for it, you see, of course, the whole body's connected. Right. So we're going to breathe with everything at once. So for those of you who can feel the neck in general, the best, well, those, were, those would be the two best exercises, I believe, to try it is essentially letting your head tilt forward and see if you can notice a slight tug back and then see if you can notice a tug on your jaws. Okay. But everyone's doing excellent as a group. Please continue practicing this. This is what is going to get you the flexing of the skull bones and the opening of the head diaphragm and the pops and cracks and adjustments. And practice it while I'm talking. Okay. Keep practicing and then I'll just tell you some more theory. So, theoretically speaking, this zygomatic arch, you can, you can see just visually, it, it pretty much looks like you have a diaphragm in your head. Okay, so the zygomatic arch is the most exterior sort of manifestation. The arch runs, or sorry, the diaphragm runs from the back of your head. And if you follow my mouse, you'll see that this is, this is the suboccipital ridge. So if you put your hand on the back of your head, and you feel where those suboccipital muscles attach to. That's the suboccipital ridge. And then the, the it goes through your head, through the tentorium cerebelli, and then down, if you're following my mouse, down here to your palate. Okay. And you can see, even on this gentleman here, you can kind of see the ridge. That's the suboccipital, and then it goes like so. And then you can follow it all the way down here to his palate, okay? And this is something that's somewhat identified already in like anatomy trains that your SCM muscles right here, what we're looking at is the sternocleidomastoid. As I said, it comes up and then it becomes like a mesh. This, this whole thing up here is your scalp and your fascia. And it essentially just meshes into this and then comes around the other side. So every time you breathe in, you're tugging down, you're tugging down and open the back here, which is important because that's what needs to get tugged down and open to, to pull everything open. Okay. And that is the, that mastoid process where your SEM and that connects into is that process that is developed into adulthood. Now, what's really important, this is the outside and you can see here, uh, if I increase the size of this image, like right around where the SEM starts merging into is the, is the combination of your temporal bone, your parietal bone, and your occipital bone. So it's like really pulling open this suture. And it's at the suboccipital ridge as well. Don't worry about the uh, terms so much as you worry about what the actual feeling, what's actually going on inside of your own feeling and your own experience. Okay. Now, what's important for us is that on the inside, you know, what's on the inside of that is the tentorium cerebelli, the head diaphragm, which, uh, which others have noted as well. Okay. So this has been noticed before, but not in such a deep way, as far as I know, that this is your head diaphragm. And so on the outside, the the SCM muscles and these neck muscles pull it open. And on the inside, this head diaphragm opens. And if you can start getting a feeling, a lot of yawning, exactly. It's amazing, right? So if you can get a lot of feeling 
and your proprioception is good, you can start getting a feeling for the tentorium and inside the head. I'll breathe with you and I, I hope you can get it in this lesson even. But you, you, you need to get your awareness and your proprioception and your feeling up to the level that you can feel inside the head and essentially um, do adjustments on yourself and start popping things open. This works the same way if, if you like to, you know, have that as above, so below type understanding. This works the same way as the psoas and these muscles connect into the back of your main respiratory diaphragm and they, they help pull that open. In the same way, your chest muscles and your neck muscles attach to the back of your head and they help pull open this, uh, this skull diaphragm. Good. And you can see on this image in the right here, this is like your zygomatic arch, which is this arch that we we're speaking about here, how, it, how it's basically part of this diaphragm. And this is why when you, know, you do MSC or you, you do palate expansion and all these things, it, it can only push your, your maxilla and your palate open so much before your, your tentorium and your head diaphragm in general, they're not gonna let it open further. And this is, this is called the dura mater, the tough mother is the name of that, because it's very tight, tough fascia. It's not gonna let you anything expand. Um, and you can expand the face and the jaws and get everything open um, until this whole head diaphragm expands. So I've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, how do I move my maxilla forward and things like that. It's, it's not moving the maxilla forward, the whole head, the entire width of the head has to expand. And as you get better at this, I want you to notice now, like how much is your, your chest really expanding? How much is your main diaphragm expanding? Yeah. So I'm gonna ask again about feeling. And yeah, we'll go into q &A. We're pretty good for time right now. Um, let's ask about the feeling again. And I, I wanna know, you know, if you can feel it at all and how many of you can feel the diaphragm in your head? I'll, I'll put this on the screen. Well, no, I shouldn't put it on the screen so more people participate. And an amazing amount of you can start feeling the diaphragm of the head, which is excellent. And you can get a feel, you got the left tentorium and the right tentorium and why you know Sutherland and such really did understand to a deep level um, why you can feel that the tension of the body really is in those deep levels. Because when trauma is really deep, now what we're gonna go into tomorrow is that you have a frontal line and a back line, and those are involved in the breathing and opening up the body. And a large part of what we do is having to release trauma down the front so that the frontal lines can open and you can have expansion. Um, but deep trauma, really deep things start releasing in the meninges and in the spine. Good. Uh, so here's the poll results so far. Um, so yeah, and a large percentage of people can even feel it in the head, which is amazing. Really glad with that. Good. Continual practice. Um, what you're feeling today is not the end of what you're going to be feeling. This just gets deeper and deeper until the point where I, I say again, as Hopkins Institute says, and is well known by now, your fascia and your meninges, you can, they're almost as sensitive as your skin. So you can feel your entire body from the inside out. You have that capacity. When you have a headache, you notice it. When you have a ache or pain, then you notice that you can feel them. But there's no reason to be unconscious the rest of your life, especially if you're trying to fix an issue. Okay? So when you, through the breathing, we're going to gain consciousness of these entire structures. And that's how we can get to fixing them. Okay? And you become your own physician. So that's the end of the main training portion for today. What we're going to talk about is essentially the results. The, our long-term goal um, is full correction. So to fully expand those diaphragms and opening up the entire width of the skull. So the cheekbones, the maxilla, everything comes forward, the back of the head pops into 
into place. Um, this, the issues that happen in the brain with a compressed skull, um, I won't go into those now, but there are issues that happen there. And also the compression of the spine, compression of the body. Um, that's our long-term goal to get everyone all the way back to correction. Like they were in pre-industrialized, pre-agriculture type of times. Um, we think because of trauma, the traumatic experience and the lack of working out trauma has essentially caused the collapse in people. Um, that's a bit more of the inference theory. We try to stick to, you know, scientific understanding and peer reviewed stuff, but we can infer some things. And that's, that's been my inference over a lot of observation. Um, and yeah, uh, you will get to the point if you keep practicing that, that you start getting adjustments in your skull and you will start getting um, psychosomatic changes uh, and a lot of opening. Um, here's a, a question to see where everyone's at. In terms of mewing, because I, I've been getting, I, I want to know where, where the community is at. Like who, who here has heard of the phrase mewing? And I'll, I'll answer what it is uh, in a bit if you don't, if you haven't heard of that. Okay, so about 75% of people have heard of mewing. And what mewing is, is essentially the understanding. There's a, there's a doctor called John Mew and Mike Mew, they're dentists, and uh, they, they've started something called orthotropics, right? Uh, what mewing was, was the widespread understanding of myofunctional therapy type of processes where the tongue shapes the mid face, okay? So the posture of the tongue shapes this area and a lot of debate regarding pacifiers, regarding breastfeeding, things like that. Um, and from that came ideas like chewing, that chewing hard food is what develops this nasal maxillary area. Uh, for those who have heard of it, I, I would like to propose to you that theories show, that, or sorry, studies show that chewing activates this SCM muscle and the neck muscles. And so I think what people are doing when they're chewing, mewing, um, somebody had asked about holographic type of breathing. Um, I think essentially what those are is, because some people do get results from those things. I think the reason some people get results is what they're actually doing is they're activating this deeper chain of muscles that really is what pulls open the skull. So somebody starts hard mewing, you know, they really push their tongue up hard and they end up supporting the front of their skull. So their neck starts activating or they start chewing hard foods, which starts activating the sides of their neck again. So almost incidentally, they, they start activating what we're doing here, which is activating the main muscles. Yeah. Um, so tomorrow what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going into the tongue. Um, where, where we think, how the tongue we think should be functioning. Uh, agreeing with John Mew in many ways about the importance of the back third of the tongue, um, but looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, and we're gonna be looking at the wider chain. So how all of these muscle chains, the jaw, the tongue, the neck, how they fit together as one cohesive whole. Um, but we're gonna be staying in the head because I think that's where a lot of people are interested most. Um, in terms of psychosomatics, I've had questions about that. Um, yeah, we have great results. And that, that was something that was incidentally noticed that became the theory. Uh, oh, why do we have these contractions down our front? And um, if you were in the class yesterday, we spoke about samkocha and those uh, theories that you have egoic tightening. Your body and your mind are one. So the memories that you have, the things that you're holding on to, those are sort of stored in your body. If you have a heartbreak, you, you clench your chest, you know, your chest collapses forward. Um, if you have any sort of fear, you kind of collapse forward into a fetal position. Your SCM and your psoas, they contract and they protect your viscera, they protect the front of your body. And essentially people are collapsed down the front it is the issue. Um, so we'll go more into that tomorrow. And yeah, the, the results for myself have been amazing. My whole life is so different than last year. Like my life is unrecognizable for almost from last year or two years ago even. And um, a lot of people have noticed that well as well. Their life changes, their mental patterns change, um, physical patterns and life patterns and 
all of these things all go together, which is what we found over time through experience. Um, it's a lot harder to empirically prove that, you know, it, it is just difficult. So we try to stick typically in our public facing stuff to what is more evidence based, what is uh, inference. And people do have those sort of releases. And it's been amazing. So please continue to practice. You'll get links to the social media groups. We're going to do a QA and a in a second if you do have questions. Um, if you if you were in the chat before and you were asking me stuff, please try and like copy and paste it again so I don't got to go back up the chat. Um, and you can book a call with me. I'll leave the link down here. Uh, that's something I have to address as well. And let's, let's start getting into Q&A. Start popping it in, in the Q&A sections better. Um, and then I'll check out the chat before I go as well. Um, something I want to address here, I got, I got asked questions about like sessions, like how much do you charge per session? And this isn't like a session model. This is a training. Um, I previously used to do sessions. Um, I, I don't want to do a session on you. I want you to do this on yourself. So I want you to become a master of this, uh, this feeling of all these diaphragms and opening up the whole body and how the entire system fits together. And there's a one-on-one -on -one training, which is like, if you are a professional, which I, I will ask that poll right now, actually, I need to know how, how many professionals there are in here. Um, if you're a professional and you want to practice, like you, you want to get this down 100% to the point where you can start prescribing exercises or start teaching it to others, I would recommend one-on-one -on -one type of stuff. And then otherwise we have a project, essentially, the long-term goal for us is full correction, which ends up being psychosomatic correction. And we're not going to shy away from that goal. Where we're at so far is getting skull bones adjusted and getting, you know, the spine adjusted and getting people feeling more open. And But we're not going to lose sight of our long-term goal. So that's who we are as a project. Um, if you want to sign on to the training, that is like a, the pre-recorded training, it's, your, it's at your own pace then you're signing on to the project and you're going to just get continuous lifetime updates and the community updates and the group coaching and everything. And we're going to continue working forward as a community. Um, so if you want to contact me about those options, that's in the chat. Good. And uh, now, we'll, now we'll just go into the question and answer. I'll show myself. And go through the Q and A. Okay, so someone's a bit confused. Just excellent. Um, the breathing helps the diaphragm of the head, which may play a pivotal role in development of the face. But we all breathe. So what is the right way to breathe? Have those of us with with underdeveloped jaws been breathing improperly? Um, because I know my SEM isn't just active; it's overactive. It's overactive in people with underdeveloped jaws and airway issues, and a common sight. Of trigger points. So we all do breathe. The right way to breathe is, can I pull this up? Now we have a Discord server and I'm gonna have to go and post an image that I posted in the private community, which is like for the members of the training. Um, here is that, share my screen. Good. And the proper way to breathe, this is from an anatomy trains book actually, that the back line, we won't be doing this in this training, unfortunately it's not the time for it, but the back line tenses just slightly. And the way fascia works is like, if you have an aponeurosis or somewhere where the fascia is really tight, like the dura matter, if that tenses just slightly, the way tensegrity works is the places where the fascia is looser and less dense, that expands quite a bit. So down the back of your body, you have this back line that contracts just a bit, and that opens up the front line of the body, okay? And that pulls that whole thing open. And that is what proper breathing looks like um, in terms of your whole body expanding on the inhale. Um, somebody just asked what a tongue tie is, which perfectly fits into what I'm talking about. A tongue tie is this front line essentially being really too tight, in my theory, in my understanding, okay? Um, that this, that's essentially what a tongue tie is. People have done dissections 
of this part of the skull, or sorry, this part of the skull of the tongue. And the floor of your mouth is the bottom of your tongue. And then the floor of your mouth essentially becomes the muscles above your hyoid, which becomes your neck muscles. So if you have a tongue tie, that means that muscle chain has a ligament, which is too tight. Um, that can be caused by a variety of things, but at the end of the day, this is your frontal chain being uh, overly tight. So we'll go back to, yep. And so in terms of what is breathing properly, when the back line and the front line are properly functioning, the back line tugs and the whole front opens up. And you have a very easy breath. I've been told that like the ideal breath is one that somebody who's watching doesn't even notice. It doesn't look like you're breathing. That's of course the, the far advanced yogic type of ideal breath, which is like no breath. And what happens, I propose over time, is traumas down the front of the body. Say you have a heartbreak, something like that. You contract and you don't fully let go of that. And you end up hunched over. We, we know this is true to a large degree because scientific studies show and the evidence shows um, that there was one study where they got people at a desk um, and uh, people who were working. And they gave them phones to work on. They gave them cubicles that were too small and they gave them small screens. And so they had to work hunched over all the time. And they found that these people slowly stopped speaking less. They were less confident. They didn't say as much in meetings. And then they switched them back. They gave them big monitors and big desks. And so they could, you know, with their shoulders back. And these people became outgoing again. Um, and that's what the theory and the understanding behind things like power poses are. Um, that, you know, when, when you want to be confident, you, just, you lift your chest up and you do that for a while. And you, you, it's psychosomatic. Your body and your mind are one thing. So they both go together. Um, that's why why smiling works. If you want to lift your mood, you just smile and you automatically your mood lifts. Um, so what the improper breathing pattern is, is the front lines becoming too tight and then it, it collapses this whole system because that's what tensegrity is. It needs that balance. And as the balance starts to break down, the system starts to break down. And so it's either the front lines became too weak or the back lines or sorry, the front lines overpowered the back line or the back line is too weak. It needs to be stronger so it can pull everything open is our theory. Uh, you did mention about like overactive SEMs and stuff. Those are, those are like a case by case basis, but for most people, um, this is like a generalization of what happens to them. It, it depends on, you know, some people are holding stuff in this place. Some people are holding stuff in this place. Some people are breathing, breathing entirely with their upper chest. Importantly speaking, even if your SCMs are really active and say pulling a lot here, again, they are not going to be able to open up your head unless the meninges let go. And this is really the deep level of trauma and uh, fascia. Okay. So no matter how much, how hard you pull, even if you put an MSC appliance in there and literally have mechanical force trying to rip the whole thing apart, the meninges need to relax. Um, and doing it with mechanical force is not the right way. That's a traumatic way to do it um, in most cases. In most cases, okay? Speaking generally. Um, so let's go back to you, Kiernan. I hope I answered that uh, to your satisfaction. Um, can you say more exactly how your life has changed from doing this? I, you know how Google Photos shows memories? Um, okay, so I, I think the thing I'll, I'll share most comfortably, I was drug addicted, uh, alcoholic, uh, tobacco, and marijuana. And yeah, those dropped away. And other people who have been doing this sort of thing have had addictions drop away as well. Um, I was deeply, deeply addicted to alcohol for about six or seven years. And I'm not anymore. And family life has improved amazingly, like my relationship with my parents, uh, my relationship with the opposite sex, my relationship with everyone. 
how I view life, my, what my life is like. Like everything's almost unrecognizable. It's been a huge change. Um, and spiritually as well. This, the level of spiritual understanding has gone alongside this. Thank you. Um, someone who has big reactions with their TMJ issues, including challenges eating and chewing since yesterday's class. Okay, I do have a history of surgery to correct it. So having an OMT with my children, I noticed similar reactions. Um, if you are having TMJ issues with this, what I need you to do is not tug as hard, okay? So at any point you get pain, that's, that's not doing it uh, in the way that we should have it be done, okay? We're not, until you get advanced with this, until you get really good at it, don't tug. Don't do anything. Just notice. If you'll notice the instructions that I've been giving, I'm not saying tug the back of your head or like tug your jaw. I'm saying notice that these tugs are happening all the time. It's possible that when you start noticing the tugs, you start noticing what's going on in the TMJ that you became numb to. Um, but please be very careful with that. Don't, don't pull too hard here. The majority of the force is behind at the back of your head. These muscle chains are all connected, but be gentle and just notice. Don't breathe harder. Don't breathe more intensely. Don't breathe to tug. Just notice that every time you breathe in, this is what's happening, okay? Um, it's very intense. And what can I do differently or how can I settle it with this practice? I'm not unfamiliar with it. However, I'm making the correction with the self-adjustments that are happening in this practice. I did feel significant shifts yesterday and have pops on the opposite side. So that's excellent. You, you, you have a feeling for, you have the capacity to feel what's going on in your TMJ. And this is to become your own physician. So I'm training you to notice what's happening there. And then when you notice what's happening there, you can get a feel for how things need to expand, what needs to let go. Um, there's so many reasons that temporal or these TMJ issues could be happening over over tight temporals. Uh, one big one that this area is just not expanded properly, not grown properly is the biggest one, I think. Um, Cause this is a modern epidemic, you know, TMJ issues back in the day when we really had to chew hard stuff were, would have destroyed us. Um, T, TMJ is a modern issue. So we're trying to get back to the level of human, proper human development where these skull jaw issues are a very small percentage of uh, problems, not, not like a worldwide epidemic. That it's been treated as normal, but it's not. It's not normal for humans to have these issues at such a high rate. Animals don't. We're not, we're not a, that big of an exception. And we didn't have them. And it, about 10,000 years ago, they started showing up in the archaeological record that people started having these sort of issues. Before that, the jaws were developed really well. So pl please, for everyone doing this, especially if you have TMJ issues, this can help. I, I never had those issues, but people that have trained with me, um, if you sign up for a call, you'll see on the testimonial page after that, somebody who was having issues with chewing um, and their TMJ pain reduced quite a bit uh, with the breathing. Most importantly, that this is a noticing practice, okay? We're not trying to pull everything into place. It's tempting, but... Just notice what's happening and you'll get a better understanding of what's going on with the TMJs. Um, what is trauma? Is it something bad that happened to us? Um, so essentially, yes. Uh, yesterday we had explored something that was called samkocha, which is like a holding pattern. Um, it's, a, it's a contraction. And this is what in Sanskrit, or Sanskrit, that's the language, but like in more ancient systems, the feeling of the ego was described as a feeling in the body. It's a habitual holding pattern. When you get scared or shocked or anything that happens, you essentially hold on to your body because your body is the sense of identity for your ego. Um, and the place that it will usually contract largest is usually at the, the base, the root, which is like a survival mechanism. So the level of identification with the body and the level of safety, it essentially contracts you. And to be less egoic, less affected by the past, less affected by your own stories of yourself is an opening experience. And that goes 
alongside this opening experience as well. Okay. Um, so a trauma can be obvious trauma. It can be a physical one. You know, you get hit really hard in the chest and it's a trauma. You hold on to that and it affects your whole breathing pattern. And that's something that would be easily, you know, I could I could propose that to you right away. But something that if you go through a heartbreak or you're going through an extended period of you're closing off in some way, those build up over time. And if you don't let go of them, it's essentially turning you into a fetal position. If I could look that up right now. Those of you who have been around with me for a while know my propensity to just end up on Google, uh, Google images in order to uh, explain the ideas. So a fetal position, what it is, is essentially your SEMs, uh, fetal position danger. Not, not the actual fetus position, but like what the position of, well, I'm only seeing pictures of uh, babies, but what a, a fetal position is, is you're protecting the back of your neck and you're protecting your viscera, your organs. And so what that essentially means is that you curl up into a ball, which means your SCMs and your psoas essentially are contracting to protect yourself. And over a period of traumatic situations over time or suddenly, you're contracting and you never uncontracted. So that ends up interfering with your breathing, which if the breathing gets interfered with, this tensegrity pattern, which pulls your body into shape, that collapses. Okay. That's a deep question. What is the trauma exactly? It goes all the way down to what is the ego? Um, how come at times when I breathe, the jaw closes instead of opens? Uh, your temporal, I would assume, I would believe, your temporal is pulling up stronger. So that's your back line. We're not going to do the back line, but it's really important. So if you can notice that, that your, your back line goes up your scalp and then notice down the back of your head, all the way back down your spine, and that's going to tug back on the inhale. Okay. Um, is contacting the back of the teeth part of this theory? Because it's very important to mewing as a main role in development of the face. Now, the teeth have a lot of nerve contact in them, right? Like each tooth each tooth has its own nerve. So there's a lot of feedback given from the teeth. Um, one thing that happens with the breathing, so what you're doing today, if you continue practicing it, one indication that you're doing it really well, see what I try to do initially is that I don't tell people what to expect so that when they tell me they feel this, that I didn't tell them, I didn't put that in their head, okay? I'm going to continue that for this training, okay? Because I can't keep letting the cat out of the bag because I'm trying to be a bit scientific with it. Like I tell people what to do and then a large portion of them come back to me and say, I feel this thing. I wasn't expecting this other part of my body to be affected. And when it's replicable like that, then we have theory, then we have a practice, right? Um, so the teeth are involved. Um, in terms of contact, uh, I think that's more, uh, it's not something you can try to hold. Teeth in contact should happen by itself. If it's not happening by itself, you trying to put it into contact can correct things, like with splint therapy, things like that. Um, in, in more of a, it's better than, because I, I hesitate to say Band-Aid now that I know that there's a lot of health professionals on here, but it's better than most ways, you know, because you're actually working with the structure of the body. But the teeth should naturally come together. That's what your body's supposed to do. Lightly come together and have, give each other that sort of sensory feedback. So we, rather than putting the teeth together, we're trying to figure out why the whole skull and such didn't grow in such a way and why the muscle patterns are not in such a way that, that naturally happens. Okay. Um, after identifying restrictions, how would we go about releasing them? When you can feel a restriction down the front of your body. Some story might come up. It's not necessary that it does. It's possible to release things without going through the stories, without going through the whole process. But if you just pay attention to that area and continue breathing into it, because now that we've determined that your whole fascial network breathes into your hands, into every part of your body, 
you can sort of direct this part to, you can follow the breath through the body, through the chest, you can see what's expanding, what's not, and you can follow the breath through the body and see where it's trying to go and it, it can't expand into that area. And you just stay there with your awareness and your breath. Emotions will likely start coming up. Stories may start coming up. Nothing might come up. And if you stay with it long enough, things should start to release. That is where I was at for like a solid six months before I started teaching this to other people like a while ago. Because I thought if I just release these things, then things will pop back open. But the, the fascial web that is your body, your, your psychosomatic system is too many layers deep to dig through all of them. And most of the time we're adding new layers all the time anyways, right? But I, that is a, an important thing that you can do and you will notice the physical effect. So what typically happens is you breathe into that thing, it's traumatic, you can feel the constriction in your body, you might feel emotions welling up, you might think what the memory is, a memory might even come up. And then as you release it, you can, you can might cry, you might have some sort of release, you might feel it physically open up. And then we get into the talks of like, possibly even possibly today we'll get into it, this type of Kundalini energy where, you know, uh, I liken that to your nervous system energy because to contract your fascia takes energy. To contract any muscle or contract any part of your body takes energy, okay? So if you're holding on to heartbreak in your chest, you're, you're taking, you're using energy to hold on to that because your, your nervous system, everything is constantly signaling to your muscles and to that fascia, contract, 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 contract. And so when it releases, what's often described as like a, a jolt of electricity or a cool chill feeling. And what I think is essentially just that uh, piezoelectric type of charge of all of that tissue, finally letting go of the signal of contraction and it just opens up. Um, yeah, so if one has forward head posture, does one need to correct the head posture in order to get proper front and back activation? Your posture is you. The breathing and your posture, it's all one thing. So you don't, you don't correct this and then do the breathing. With the breathing, you're going to detect why is my head forward. You're going to feel where your fascial chains are tight. And then you're going to start releasing them. Uh, are we saying we shouldn't breathe from the belly? So belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, that came about because of the noticing that people were breathing from their upper chest. Because that's, that's like a stress pattern of breathing, right? You're, you're just breathing from up here. And then had people notice, hey, your diaphragm is actually where the majority of the breath should come from. So they drop into there and they relax. and that's what a pattern starts releasing. So, you know, to say diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing, that, that was kind of a tool to get people who are really too up here to go down a bit further. Yeah. But in reality, the whole thing expands. As you can feel with the hands in this exercise, the whole thing's involved in breathing. Yeah. Alan, uh, please reach out to me. Okay. Um, the recordings, I'll drop those in the chat once more. We are pretty good for time. Tomorrow is going to be another hour and then we end up doing like an hour and then half an hour for Q and A. So I'm going to drop the recordings, the location of them in the chat again. You should be getting emails too. It really helps us if you check your email and then like move us out of the promotions folder because we, we keep getting put in the promotions. Uh, I'll have a quick look through of the chat. Really, uh, a lot of people are sharing their their stories uh, regarding addiction and stuff, and I'm really proud of everyone who's currently going through that and um, everyone who's had success in going through that as well. Okay. Okay. So I'm not I'm not going to be going all the way up further down the thing. Um, up up the chat. Thank you for today. Tomorrow, we're going to be going 
deeper into the chains as a whole, please practice. Really important to continue practicing. And uh, we'll talk more psychosomatic, esoteric stuff. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the course and the training. And really think of it as a project. We are a project to always be on the cutting edge of this. Okay. So uh, when people drop in the chat, hey, you know, this other method talks about this. Yeah, really. Like that, that really is the point that we're putting everything into this. And I don't think it's been explored. I, I don't think anyone's you know, community has explored it in the way that we are doing so far today. Thank you everyone so much. Please practice. I'll see you tomorrow.